and you believe what the Lord has done in me.
this new song. It's called Overcome. <clears throat>
worship God. Lord God, we give you all the thanks and the honor you're enthroned this evening in the praises of your people, Lord God. We lift up our hearts before heaven. Amen. We're going to believe God this evening. Amen. Praise God. Can we pray right now? Amen. Let's pray for our leadership churches, uh, the Mitchells, the Morales. Let's pray for what God is doing in uh, the uh, West Coast. Amen. Let's pray for all the brand new churches that have been launched out. I think there were 14 that were sent out in January. Let's pray for their success. Let's pray for uh, people to get saved. Let's pray for miracle healings and, amen, pillars to lock into the church, amen, and, and to back the work, amen. Let's pray for their finances. Every brand new church. Let's also, while I'm on the subject, pray for this new church in Providence, Rhode Island, amen. They need miracles. They need God to move, amen. And without uh, God's intervention, amen, it will fail. Except the Lord builds a house, they that labor, labor in vain, amen. We need to uh, link our hearts together and believe God for miracles, even here in Greece Church, amen. We're going to pray also for the Suspanskis, the Kings, the Spicers in Jacksonville. Let's pray for Pastor Paul and Linda Campbell, Chip and Lori Guineer. Amen. On the cake, let's pray for Pastor Keith and Carrie Sullivan in Brighton, uh, having their service right now, probably praying for us at this very moment to believe it, if you can believe that or not. Amen. Because they're believing God for our success. Amen. For your success as a Christian. Amen. And for your breakthrough that you need in your life so that you can be fruitful. Amen. Let's lift up some other requests here. We have Chase. Working at Buffalo Wild Wings, needs a miracle in his body. Uh, Doug and Wendy, Holy Ghost refreshing. The town of Greece, Leon Fuller, amen. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for uh, Debbie and Gina and Michael to get back in church. Uh, a fellow by the name of Tom who came Sunday night for the second time. That's glorious. Let's believe God for his conversion and his success in living for God, learning how to be faithful to the work, learning how to study and read. Let's also pray for our police officers and firefighters and active military, those who are constantly laying their lives down, amen, for our safety, for our success, and for miracles in our life, amen. Let's pray and lift up these requests before heaven. Maybe there's a need in your life, something that you're battling, and I'm going to ask you to lift your hands so we can pray with you. When God sees your hands that are going up all over the place, amen. God cannot help but move upon a desperate heart, and we're thankful that we have God, that we can call on his name, and that he'll move, and he'll help us, and he'll help you too, amen, to get that breakthrough that you've been yearning for, that you've been praying for, and believing God throughout the months and the years and past. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. And believe God for each and every one of these requests. And when we subside, I'm going to ask David to open us up in a word of prayer. Amen. Let's pray, church. God, you're an awesome God. We're expecting you to do great things in our lives, God. We're confessing you as Lord and Savior, God, the author and the finisher of our faith. There's nothing that we can do of any value, of any sustainability, God, of any long-lasting goodness, God. I pray that uh, you would see us, God, and help us in our dilemma in making choices, God, giving us breakthrough, God, giving us dominion, God, as we're calling out to you. We thank you, Jesus. We know, Lord, that from the outreach that God saved, all we need to know is to know what they are so we can follow along. We ask, Lord, that you speak to us. Show us what you want us to do in your name. Yes. To greet everyone, make everybody feel welcome this evening. Hallelujah.
Praise God. Amen. Thank you for coming to church. Amen. We greatly appreciate your fellowship with us. Amen. We want to encourage you to come back uh, on Sunday morning at 1030. We have our service 1030 in the morning. Amen. We also want to remind you about Sunday evening service at 630. We meet uh, for prayer at 5.30, amen, the Lord's Day, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, amen, was on Sunday. That's why they, uh, all the Christians would gather together on Sunday. It became a very special day, amen. I'm going to encourage you to think about uh, a Sunday or Sunday evening. Wednesday, we have a midweek service for those online that uh, are uh, not aware of the uh, service we have at, at 7.30, and 6.30 is uh, our time where we pray. We're, we're going to have to get a hold of God if you want to see miracles, if you want to see people get saved, if you want to see uh, a great success in your life, you're going to have to pray, amen. And when you come to prayer before the church service, it helps us to establish God's presence and God's spirit in our service where we can be, amen, anointed in our service, amen. And I would like to remind you about the upcoming events we have um, planned for Grease Potter's House. We have our Ralph Blanco revival. That's the 18th on Sunday night. Amen. It's going to be his first service. And then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, he will be here at 7.30. 6.30 we'll be praying. If you could be faithful to all of those or as much as possible, amen, you understand that uh, all of us agreeing together, amen, in prayer, amen. God shows up and helps the services to run smoother, to be more successful. Amen. When there's more people here, more people of faith, more people that believe God and expect miracles. Amen. And I'd like to also uh, ask you to begin to pray for me. I'm going to be traveling to a conference for our uh, theme this July is Fanning the Flame. It's a world challenge. Amen. So that we can reach souls. Amen. And touch the world with planting of churches. And we're going to be fasting on the 3rd, the 4th, and the 5th. Amen. I personally will be doing a water fast if you'd like to join me. Or you have questions about fasting. We need God. We need God to help us so that we can be successful in what we're doing. Amen. Because this is not a club. This is not a, just a, a hobby or something. Amen. This is something of desperate nature. We need Jesus and we need God to help us so that we can be uh, eternally successful. Amen. Let's pray together. Let's knit our hearts. And let's trust God to do something miraculous. Amen. In our lives. As I testified, uh, let's change the order of the service. On Sunday evening, I talked about Pastor Mitch Connors, who had, uh, at the age of 18, received a, a $10,000 inheritance from his uh, grandfather. And uh, nothing was going on in his life. He felt dead in his Christian faith. He was raised in the church, raised in the potter's house. But he said to God, he said, God, I'm going to give you all of this money. And he attributes many breakthrough things in his life because of that money that he gave to God freely. And nobody told him to do it. It wasn't forced, but he made that uh just something extravagant, an extravagant sacrifice. And he uh, claims that that year he met his wife. They've been married for a couple decades now. They have a beautiful family. He's actually pastoring. He had ministry breakthrough. He got involved in church. And he attributes all his success to that one decision of putting that massive amount of money in the plate. This is no lie. I'm not making this up. He just told me on Saturday when we were outreaching. And it's a glorious thing. I'm going to encourage you to give. As God is speaking to every individual here, we each know that the tithe is holy. It is 10% of your income. That's where you begin to start learning about offering to God, making sacrifices. And then after that, the offerings that you make is out of a free will. It's not a duty. It's not laborious because God loves a cheerful giver when we give. Amen. God is glorified. God looks down on us. He's smiling on us and he's uh, grateful that we're obedient to him. Amen. Let's give to the work. Amen. David, can you come forward and pray over the offering? Amen. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Let's give with a cheerfulness. 
Amen. Out of a thankfulness of what he's done and what he's about to do in this upcoming revival and in our conference in the planning of churches. David, can you bless the offering? Yeah. Father, well, we thank you for the opportunity. Stop to here. Trust that you'll use it for your purposes, that you'll bless us, bless this church, that you'll bring more people in. Everybody's doing everything they can to bring people in here, and we can't do it, Lord. you got to touch them by your yeah, spirit. Yeah, that's right, Lord. So we ask that you Thank move you, by your spirit. And we want to give to a church. The church has the finances to do with that. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for your giving. Praise God. Click the link online if you're going to make a donation. Can you believe? Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? Oh, yeah. Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? Come on, sing it. Will he save me, cleanse me, and turn my life around? Set my feet up on the solid ground. Sustainability is at the heart of everything we claim. Have you ever heard any of these new age companies say this? <laughs> Almost as common as greenwashing this year was companies saying that sustainability was in their DNA. Pretty funny, huh? Like or at the heart of everything we do. And if it was, then perhaps global emissions wouldn't break new records each year. And anybody listening to me? Here's one of the trillion times companies spewed this hat phrase in 2021. At Aquilo, sustainability lies at the core of the brand's operations with its belief that its clothing has the power to change the world for the better, wrote the Japanese fashion Brand's PR agency announcing its participation in a webinar on unlocking the power of clothing. <laughs> As if the clothing that you wear is going to determine your sustainability and caring for the world. Maybe there are recycled, <laughs> recycled clothes. Maybe they're made from old plastic, old plastic cartons or something. Or maybe you recycle paper. Maybe your old newspaper. Advice to corporate. Stop saying sustainability is in your DNA. It's not true and nobody believes you. There's something funny I came up with. And it is called Sober by Mid-Century. In other words, 2050. So in a bit to highlight the absurdity of carbon reduction targets that don't have to be met until several decades away. Satirical website The Shovel published a story before uh, the climate talks in Scotland about a man who pledges to stop drinking. I swear I'm going to be completely sober by 2050. That's supposed to be funny. <laughs> Let's look tonight at our responsibility, which might be a little sobering, if I can coin a phrase, to have our faith sustain us for the long haul. Hallelujah. It's time to read our scripture. If you can join me reading Psalms 55 verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. 
this is called spiritual sustainability. And we need the ability to continue in our faith. Amen. Everybody loves the beginning of anything, a new project. You're cleaning out your house uh, or you're starting a new business perhaps. And it's very exciting in the beginning. But to carry on, to complete uh, uh, the project, there's a great challenge. In the broadest sense, sustainability refers to the ability to maintain or support a process continuously over time time. Keeping faith over time is critical for you and I. Our survival as Christians depends upon our faith. It's directly linked with our faith and forgiveness. Our business and policy contexts, one writer shares, sustainability seeks, sustainability seeks to prevent the depletion of natural or physical resources so that they will remain available for the long term. I mean, how many want to make it to the end of your race? Is there anybody out there in the middle of the race of life? Paul said, I've kept the faith. At the end of his life, he, stayed, he said, I stayed on the course. I wasn't deterred. I wasn't uh, led to the left or to the right as was told to uh, Joshua and the people of God to remember what Moses told you to do in the law and if you will stay faithful to what God has called you and I to do amen he will give us our promised land he will make us successful amen prayer is going to be our link to our future, to our destiny, to our sustainability. Our faith is only going to be in certain uh, just, uh, you know, rushes or uh, maybe emotional kinds of uh, working and moving forward. I'm looking for the word in my mind or uh, bursts of energy, you could say. If it's only feelings, amen, you're not going to make it. You're going to have to do something different than just relying upon how it feels or how it looks. Uh, what it, the scriptures say, Paul said, we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Amen. Not when everything's going good, hurrah, 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 or when everything's gone and there's nobody here, there's uh, no money, there's, uh, you have problems in your life and you're a failure. It's not going to change God because God never changed. He remains the same and he's going to help you and I. We need to see that. We need to have that prayer life where we can link to the living God who will empower you and help you to deal with issues, uh, rejection, to help you with problems with people and how people are cold and mean and how they have rejected you and cut you off at times perhaps. Throughout every assault, even the best of friends, should I say, Amen. Let's look at this critical issue to our faith. We need to pray. Psalm 55, 1, give ear to my prayer. He writes earlier in the verse, verses here, Oh God, do not hide yourself away from my supplications. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and moan noisily because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they have bringing me down, uh, for they bring trouble down upon me, and in wrath they hate me. And man, you're going to have to pray, man. Because you know what? This Christian life is a long and uh, complicated, arduous traveling we have to do throughout uh, relationships, throughout difficulties, throughout pressures, throughout trials. You're going to have to learn how to deal with it. And prayer should be your First response, whenever anything goes wrong, you should be like, man, I gotta pray about this. You have a huge decision. I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna get a hold of God. Otherwise, you just fail, you'll just give up. You will turn quickly aside, you'll be like, forget about you. It should be a knee-jerk reaction. 
when you're at the doctor's. You remember going to the doctor? He takes that little hammer. <laughs> you sit down there and he hits the nerve on your knee and your leg pops out. It's a knee-jerk reaction. This should be our first response. Always. David is in one desperate situation after another. Can you say amen? He's got issues. His problems got problems. He's always having difficulty. He goes to bring the wine and the cheese and the supplies to his brothers at the battle. And Goliath is there mocking the armies of God. They're not moving forward. And David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? How dare you mock my God? David's got problems. He's going to uh, have to fight this Goliath who could be eight, ten feet tall. We don't know, but we know that giants are real. We have skeletons uh, that have been donated to the Smithsonian. They're somewhere in the basement. We can't find them anymore. But there are giants, and there are giants in your life too. Amen. Desperate situations that you have that you're going to have to pray and uh, come uh, above and beyond what you have, your own faculties, your own abilities. You're going to need God. You must pray if you want to be a Christian. You could be facing enemy soldiers. You could be running from an insane King Saul who hunted him down like an animal. You know, he became jealous. You know, David comes back from the war and the, the maidens are all singing. They're singing the pop tunes of the day. Saul's killed his thousands and David is ten thousands. Yeah. And all of a sudden David's like, oh shoot. You know, everybody loves me more than the king. And the king is like, what next is he going to take from me? But the kingdom itself. And so he's getting crazy and Saul is starting to haunt uh, David. And David's got all kinds of problems. He's running and running and running. David chooses to pray. That's his superpower. Amen. His strength is activated through his relationship with God. That he can call on God. That God can strengthen him through all these things as we read about in his life. That are recorded here uh, in the historical record here from the Bible. It talks about David's life. So that God can empower him to deal with all kinds of adversity. So that God can move against David's enemies and give him complete favor and defend David. We're going to need to pray because that exact same thing happens to you and I. Amen. And secondly, we need to make uh, spiritual commitments to God. The Christian needs to realize if they want uh, that blessing to be sustained in their life, they're going to have to do a number of things. And firstly, as we sang this morning, uh, this evening earlier, we sang that song, Making Your Mind Up. You've got to make your mind up to do God's will. You're going to have to fix. It's not about your emotions. It's not about the way things look. It's what God has promised you, and he's going to fulfill it in the end. You have to go all the way, and that's with Jesus. You need to pray. You need to read your Bible. If you don't, you're going to be emaciated Christian. You're going to be like a skeleton, like those pictures from Dachau or the concentration camps. Because you've been starved. Your body is starving. Your spirit is starving for the word of God and the relationship that manna from heaven. You're going to have to get a touch of God on your life. And that comes through prayer. Reading your Bible. Discovering God's will for your life. Seeking him and finding out what he wants you to do. Making God happy, let the meditation of my heart and the words of my lips be acceptable unto you. That's the prayer that he prayed. Yeah. God, I want to be pleasing to you. And thirdly and lastly and most importantly, get ready for the assaults. What did Jesus say? Offenses must come, but woe unto those through whom they come. There's going to be difficulties. You're going to be assaulted. There's going to be problems in your job, in your family, in your relationships. It's going to happen. It's going to come. Just prepare yourself for it. This is a guarantee of the Christian life. Amen. However on earth are we going to deal with these problems? God promises to sustain you. He promises to be there with you. If you call on him, he will keep you. 
even in betrayal. Let's read what scripture records about David's life. And uh, it reads like this in verse 12, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it, nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man of my equal, my companion and my acquaintance, we took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. You can see the picture of one of David's best friends, a close associate, somebody that he's shared his dreams with. He's, he's talked to them. He's asked him questions. Uh, he's revealed to him his innermost uh, secret things about himself. And this guy turned his back on him. Who would have ever thought that? I got a quote here by Aquinelli Samson. He says, trust your friends as much as you can, but not any further. <laughs> We're not saying that there is no good man. There are good people and there are good men. But let there be a limit on your level of trust with people right. and so you don't get caught by surprise by deceitful men or by wicked men as in the case of David. Some of you yourselves, you've experienced these kind of problems with relationships. People in your life that you, 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 you gave yourself to them, you, you, you called them, you prayed for them, you babysat their children, you went out of your way to help them and encourage them, you give them money, you've done things, you've been praying for them all these years, and yet they turn their back on you. Amen, what is the natural response? I'm done, I'm not gonna love anybody else anymore. I'm not going to share anything with anybody. I am done with my faith. It's easy to give up at this point. And some of you are thinking about giving up on your faith. Look at Judas betraying Jesus. What did Jesus call Judas in the Bible? We all know Judas is a complicated guy to say the least. He is the very definition of betrayal. Not only that, but Jesus knew it beforehand. He knew it when he picked him, I suppose. The God part of Jesus, right? He knows all things. He knows, you know, the disciples that he's gathering, I need him, and I need him, and I need him, and I need, and I need, and I need him. And yet, in verse 50 of the New Testament, we read there that Jesus called him friend. One of you will betray me tonight. It's pretty painful. Think about it. Think about all the chances that, that, that you know, Jesus poured his life into Judas and discipled him and trained him and showed him how to pray for people and cast out demons, right? And even at the last minute when they're at the, uh, the last dinner, they're supping together, they're in fellowship, and Jesus talks, you know, about what's about to happen. He's giving him a chance. He's not going to use, you know, uh, the, um, you know, uh, just like a surprise to Judas, you know, he's going to reveal to him, you know, one of you will betray me tonight. He's showing Judas that it's true. He knows, Jesus knows everything. He knows everything about you. But he, at the same time, is giving him a chance to repent. He called him friend. How painful that must have been. You how you've experienced the sting of rejection also by friends who talked about yeah. you or rejected you and yeah. so on and so forth, and, you know. It would have been a little easier for Jesus if Judas wasn't close to him. Right. They ministered together. Amen. They were involved in outreaches together, perhaps. They were in a band together. Maybe they were uh, doing some follow-up together. They knit their hearts together. They were like one. They were uh, on fire. They may have prayed together. Think about all the times that Jesus prayed. Teach us how to pray, Jesus, like John's disciples asked John to teach them how to pray. And he spent time with them. Time is priceless, man. I don't know what you... What you think? I'm 62 now, man. And every relation is meaningful to you. They live together even. 
one who was called friend, even Jesus reached out to him at the last moment of time to try to maybe get him to not do that. Maybe it could have been done through another means. Peter denied Jesus, another friend. Matthew 26, 33, Peter answered and said to Jesus, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I, I, I will never be made to stumble. Peter is bragging. I will never stumble. And that is exactly what happened. That's why we have to be very careful about how we brag about our Christianity. Man, I got it together, man. I'm praying, I'm reading my four scriptures, four chapters a day, man. I'm on fire, I'm on outreach, I go to church, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but where's your heart? You gotta be careful if you start bragging. His denial of knowing Jesus was unsustainable. The little maid by the fire, you know, Jesus in the courtyard there is being interrogated ruthlessly by the uh, soldiers, the false witnesses in Caiaphas's house. And she says, you're one of them. And he says, no, baby, I'm not. You got me mistaken for somebody else. He denies Jesus. And at the same time, one of the uh, gospels talks about how Jesus looked at him at that time when he denied him three, three times, the third time. Jesus prophesied about that. Peter, you're going to deny me. Assuredly, I say to you, this night, before the cock crows, twice, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if all uh, uh, will deny you, not me, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And that's exactly what he did. And so all the rest of the disciples, they said the same thing. You know, we will go, we will, you know, be there to the bitter end. And Jesus experienced that. And I'm sure that you've experienced it too. And in rejection, when you're rejected by close associates and friends, it's painful. It's hard to get through that. There's this thing uh, that's famous in your generation for all the young people here. Uh, we had our own ways of uh, mistreating people. Uh, this is the thing called ghosting. What does it mean to be ghosted? Ghosting is when someone cuts off all communication without explanation. They don't have the class to come to you and say, you know what, um, this is not working out, I'm going to go and do this, A, B, and C, and they cordially and they classy, it's, it's a better way of doing it, but this generation today, they don't have the class to actually say it to you or to deal with you, they just reject you. It extends to all things, it seems. Ghosting. Most of us think about the context of a digital departure, Right? <laughs> or maybe the last words you could say. Sometimes it's just nothing. A friend not responding to a text or worse, a lover. But it happens all across social circumstances and it's tied to the way we view the world. How about gaslighting? This is a new one I learned this year. Gaslighting. What does it mean to gaslight someone? Psychologists use the term gaslighting to refer to a specific type of manipulation where the manipulator is trying to get someone else or a group of people to question their own reality. What are you, dumb? <laughs> right? That's basically it. Uh, your memory, question your perceptions, and it's always a serious problem, according to psychologists. And this is a way that you can manipulate people in the, your answering texts or the way that you respond online, your Instagram. I don't even know anything about that, but, but gaslighting makes you look stupid. It's a manipulation. It's a way of rejecting you and making you feel worthless. How about unfriending? What does it mean to be unfriended? It means to be removed from a list of designated friends on a person's social networking website. Many have here uh, removed other people. But you've also felt the sting of rejection when you see that that person is no longer your friend. It's depressing. It can really throw you for a loop. Especially if it's a Christian. You expect Christians to have more class, to be able to talk things through and to, you know, you know work, work relationships out. This generation has some real problems working out relationships. Let's just be honest here. And then lastly is the blocked cell phone. And that's happened to me often. Praise God, I have almost 700 phone numbers in my uh, 
on cell phone here that are connected to the church and I prayed with them. Usually when I pray with someone, they give me their phone number. I'm able to talk to them in the future, uh, invite them to different concerts and outreaches and revivals, etc. And uh, I believe most of them are probably blocked by now because I've been persistent for the past five and a half years. Maybe others even you know, longer, 10 years, 15 years, I've known some of these people. And either they've gotten a new phone or they just push that little button Block this caller. And I do it all the time. I don't know. I, I, I get all these sales calls and people, I, I have no idea who you are. And they're, they're talking about, you know, hi, this is Kate. <laughs> Just getting back to you about the loan that you want. $10,000 is available for your business. Blah, blah, blah. And that's an easy thing to do. I can just block that. That's a business call. I don't know who that person is. I never called them. And so this is part of your generation. And it's easy to block somebody. I'm just saying, that's what I do for these people. I have nothing to do with this business that I, that I did not instigate or begin or initiate. How about divorce? Divorce is probably the most painful of all of these things. Even when a relationship is no longer good, a divorce or a breakup can be extremely painful because it represents the loss, not just of a partnership, but also of the dreams and the commitments that you once shared. Romantic relationships begin on a high note of excitement and hopes for the future. So here we have uh, someone so close to yourself, especially when you get married. The Bible says the two become one flesh. It's like they are one being. They, are one, they have one identity, let's say. Yeah. And then when they decide to uh, end it, there's like a ripping of that flesh. It's very ugly. It's very painful, especially if there's children involved and then your partner wants to have uh, the house and, and all the material possessions in the car and, and the, a certain amount of money maybe. It's very painful. How about uh, church misunderstandings? <laughs> Does that ever happen? Right? Maybe you misunderstood something that the preacher said and you never came back to church. Right? That'd be the easy way to deal with that. Or a friend or a brother in the church or a sister or some kind of relationship. Thinks something else happened and they're, you know, after years and years of attending a church, you just give up. You have no idea what that's going to do to your future and your destiny. Relationships, like I said are the most precious commodity you can have in life. Write that down. And understand that uh, you shouldn't just give up so quickly and so easily. Think about your investment of time with this person or this church or these people or this ministry. Life is really all about relationships. Do everything in your power to make them good. Friend of mine, make your marriage work. Make it work successfully. Uh, concentrate on your friendships. Your friendships can help you become fruitful. Amen. And your ministry will become anointed if you pay attention to it. If you're, if you're in a ministry and you have a work to do, you want God to use your life and you want to be fruitful, you're going to have to help. Uh, let God help you. Don't ever give up, man. Don't ever just kick it to the curb. You have to think about the long haul in your faith experience. Unforgiveness is not sustainable. And that's one of the things you're just going to have to let it go. man. You're just going to have to agree to disagree with somebody and just move on, man. Don't let it be a hang up. Don't let it be a block, a hindrance to, you know, that relationship. You're going to have to forgive those people. If they don't want to forgive you, that's out of your control. Can you say amen? But it's up to us to do our part, amen. And uh, if you and I do that, amen, we will be blessed. The other person can do whatever they want. They can go their way. They can still be mad 30 years later. But you and I can be free. You and I can have wholeness. You and I can forgive them. Because that unforgiveness is not sustainable. It's not the way you can live. Amen. What's going to happen is you're going to get bitter. Amen. There's like a poison or a cancer that's going to begin to grow inside of you. And it's 
like a jaundiced eye, they say, everything you look at will be tainted yeah. with kind of a distrust for other people or an anger. Or you're going to harbor some bitterness. And anytime you see this kind of person, you're going to always categorize them there. And you're going to be either racist or maybe you're going to have a, a, some kind of a, a unfair uh, perception of that person. And you're going to have problems in your life and you're going to be adding baggage upon baggage and uh, it'll, it'll just it'll weigh you down, man. That's why forgiveness is such a wonder in Christianity. Amen. It is not going to help you for the long haul. You have to forgive. Amen. You have to let some things go. Look at, what did Paul say? Demas has forsaken me. Here, one of Paul's companions, one of his co-workers, one of his Helpers in the ministry had abandoned him for the world, the love of the world, the love of this present world. And Paul couldn't let it get to him. He couldn't let it tear him down. He couldn't let it destroy his ministry. And so he just let it go. But he remembered it. But it didn't run his life. Amen. You will never make it in the long haul in the Christian experience unless you learn how to pray and forgive those who oppress you. Amen. You're going to be burned all the way. I'm just keeping it real this, this evening. Amen. You and I have to learn how to forgive and get beyond. People are going to be people. You know that. And we have to remain faithful even when we experience people that are flawed. Because we're flawed too. We have to extend God's grace to them also. And not let our faith die. Amen. It has to be a sustainable faith. One that's looking uh, towards the future. That's not going to dry up. It's not going to die. God will cover us and he will help us if we forgive. If we give, uh, you know, get past those offenses. Settle matters quickly with your adversary. Scripture teaches us who is taking you to court. A person is going to try to charge you with something. Do it while you're still together on the way. Uh, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and the officer will throw you into jail. Do everything in your power to fix relationships. To work things through. Humble yourself. It's going to be an experience that will help you to carry through your experience and your Christian life to the very end. Unless God tells you otherwise. Maybe God is telling you to cut certain people off because they're dangerous for your Christian, for your spiritual health. And then maybe you should cut them off. But usually, and then we need to try to work things through even if somebody offends you. Matthew 18, verses 21 through 22. You read it before. Peter came up to uh, Jesus and said, Lord, how often... Well, my brother sinned against me and I forgive him up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say seven times, but 77 times. We have to bear one another. We have to learn how to carry each other. Although some of us are obnoxious, we have to learn how to forgive them, to oversee their problems. We have to learn how to forgive one another. Not hold grudges. Right? This is a supernatural event. This is something that is, is almost impossible to do as a natural person. You're going to need God to move through you to give you that ability to forgive people. Today I was speaking with a Palestinian Muslim. Pretty awesome. God brought me down to Walmart to pick up a part. And they didn't have the part, but I handed out some flyers and I started witnessing to some people. And uh, we started talking about him. He's like, he's been here for a week. And it's pretty glorious because he might be coming to church sometime. But we touched on the idea of Jesus teaching about forgiving people and uh, forgiving your enemies. He said, that's amazing. He was listening to me. He was letting it sink. And I said, even Jesus on the cross, he's looking at these people who are mocking him and spitting on him and laughing at him. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he was amazed. He was really paying attention. Pray for him. His name is Omar. 
Amen. Jesus said, if you forgive men, in Matthew 6, verse 14, if you forgive them their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That sounds like a pretty good idea. Can you say amen? If you want entrance into the kingdom of heaven, you don't have to forgive people. And Christians should forgive their enemies and their friends that rip them off. Let's close and look at this spiritual sustainability. God sustains you. Verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved or shaken, another translation says, or destroyed. If you're planning on uh, staying saved until Jesus returns or you, you, know, you take your last breath and you're taking your turn in that casket, amen, or you're going to be, you know, your uh, remains will be turned to ashes and you're going to be in a little urn on your funeral day. If you're planning on making it all the way you're going to have to let God sustain you. Don't carry your sorrows. You can't carry them. You've not been designed to carry the sorrows. You and I are not strong enough. We're called in 1 Peter to cast our burdens upon God. Because God cares for us. 1 Peter 5, 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him. For he cares for you. That's a good scripture to memorize. Don't carry it around. You can't carry it around. You're too weak. You're too fleshy. It'll crush you. It'll destroy you. Cast your burden on the Lord. If you choose to be proud and say, hey man, I got this. I'm good. I'm spiritual. I can handle this. No, you can't, buddy. You need to hand it off. Pride will kill every relationship in your life if you choose to not be humble. You think you're better than other people. It's not going to help the relationship to flow. What you are saying is, I don't really need anybody. Unless you are willing to humble yourself and work things through. Judging your enemies. Amen. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Don't ever think that when you cry out to God, God, help me. Help me. Let this person, you know, help me work this through. Don't ever think that God is ignoring you because things don't happen instantaneously. Amen. God has every intention of working in your behalf. Amen. Always be reminded that prayer will connect you with your ability to keep a right heart with God and keep right with people. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice, David wrote. And he who has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. For there were many against me. You might feel like you're all alone tonight. Or you might feel like God has forsaken you. Romans 12, 17. Repay evil for no man. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men, if it is possible. And as, as much depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God is in control. God sees what you're going through. He's going to get them. God will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from old, because they do not change. Therefore, they do not fear God. You and I have a spiritual sense that we have to be serious about making it for the long haul. That's a spiritual sustainability. I have fought the good fight. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight and have finished the race. None of us in here can say that. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are or how spiritual you think you are. None of us have made it. None of us have completely finished our task, our mission. We have a ways to go, my friend. We can't be cocky about it. We can't be a bragger like Peter. We just have to keep the faith, man. That's how it's going to sustain us. How God's going to carry us. Keeping good things in your life. It's going to take a lot of work. Anxiety, fear, pain, uh, worries, uh, unforgiveness. All these things are going to 
suck the life out of you. You have to realize it's going to have to take a lot of work. There will always be some battle. If it's something great to be attained, then it's, it's not just going to be free handouts. It's not going to be lollipops at the zoo, okay? You're going to have to really fight for this. It's a great thing. And great sacrifices must be made. Finishing, lastly, will take a determination of your mind. You have to think like Paul. You have to be willing to make it to the very end. Amen. Last quote for the service. V. Raymond Edmund is quoted on the subject of discouragement or quitting. He said, it's always too soon to quit. I'm going to encourage you to Pray tonight. Ask God to help you. Amen. To give you direction for the, the, the people in your life, the certain relationships that you're dealing with, the rejection you may be suffering through, the sorrows that you're trying to care. Let's bring them this evening here to the altar. Amen. And leave, uh, amen, those things here so that we can uh, continue and finish the work that God has called us to so that we can understand spiritual sustainability. Amen. And I pray for each individual here. Let's bow our heads. God, give revelation tonight about the battle. God, give a refreshing tonight. I ask you, God, to have every individual here this evening, every, un, uh, every saved individual to receive from heaven empowering so that they can be sustained, so that they can deal with life, so that they can become fruitful and victorious in this battle of faith. Amen. I'd like to give you an opportunity if you're not saved, changing the order of the service. Uh, that's for you this evening. You're not a Christian. You have no idea what's going on here. You're not born again. Amen. God loves you and died for your sins and he wants a relationship with you. You're never going to make it very long on that high. Drinking and drugging cracking and heart attacking and uh, living an immoral life. It's going to be fun for a season. Sin is fun. I did plenty of it. The Bible says that it's fun for a season, but you're going to have to realize that it's a heavy load. The soul that sins will surely die. Your life is not a joy. You've got to keep getting high. You've got to keep uh, having sex out of marriage. You've got to keep doing wicked things. You've got to keep thinking weird thoughts. You've got to keep that and it constantly it, it's going to have to uh, be you know added again and again and again why don't you just stop running from God and give your heart to Jesus because there's nobody that loves you like Jesus and then I witnessed to another uh, carload of people and, uh, and I said something extra to this woman in the back seat I said you know God loves you why would Jesus die on the cross if he didn't and that really got her. She froze. And then she wanted to shake my hand. And then as they were driving away, she said, thank you. Have a good day. God loves you, man. You're going to have to realize that. Even though you're living in sin, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's made an investment in you, even in your rebellion, even in your unbelief, in, even in... Uh, your wickedness. God still loves you. And if you will surrender to Him, He will give you the power to change your life. You don't have to be gay. You don't have to be a lesbian or immoral or homosexual. God is going to touch you and love you and show you what life is all about. Amen. If you would like to pray this evening, that's you. God's touching your heart. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand as a sign to me you'd like to pray. Amen. With no one moving around, amen. Or perhaps online, and this is you guys. God is talking to you. God is revealing his love for you and his power so that you can be right and become happy and successful, amen. That's you. You're going to have to uh, pray and confess your sins, amen, and give your life to Jesus. Amen. I'd like to change the order of the service. We're going to open up the altar. If you'd like to come forward and pray, you can kneel down here. Or you can sit in one of the comfortable blue chairs. Or you can sit Indian style. Or you can come up and stand and pray up here and talk to God and ask Him to help you. 
give you revelation about what he's doing and what you need to be doing. Amen. about, amen, the number of times that you've offended somebody else mm. Mm. and God has forgiven you. Think about the times when God said, I want you to do this and you said, mm -mm, and doing it. And God has been gracious to you. He's faithful to forgive us. How much more shall you and I, amen, Look down the road and see the end, amen. But it's blocked by issues and problems that we have not forgiven, we have not let them go. And I want to encourage you to let them go and let God be God, amen. Vengeance is mine, save God. Let's believe God together for a revival in your heart, your success, and your fruitfulness linked to this whole idea of spiritual sustainability. Amen. David, can you bless us as we leave? God, thank you. God, give a good week. Thank you. Lord. God, give a revival. God, God, bring us back. And be aware of you and the enemy. So we fight the enemy off and ask you to deliver us from it so that we can live lives of peace in you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that that's your plan.